thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Andre, for organizing this. This has been really lovely. lovely. Uh, and I've enjoyed spending my time with you guys um, and hanging out um, in Montreal. Um, my project, largely speaking, is to try to understand how we can come to validate some of the conjectures offered by epistemic democrats. Um, insofar as their instrumental claims, democracy is good insofar as people have the right sort of beliefs that allow them to obtain outcomes uh, that they so esteem. I want to be able to uh, interrogate whether they in fact possess those competencies. So the, uh, the nature of it is, is slightly formal, but I, I hope that it's not too formal that it's off-putting, but it just, it, it rather makes transparent what I'm trying to accomplish uh, with the project. So there are, there's a standing objection in the literature to the epistemic uh, democratic program, which asks how we can aggregate problem, we can aggregate our problems in uh, political science when we're really dealing with values rather than facts. That is, people disagree on fundamental issues, and there's just no way of actually considering that they're that when we aggregate in, in some kind of voting mechanism, uh, whether it's through procedures like, or it, through mechanisms like the Condorcet jury theorem or the miracle of aggregation, that in fact what, what we're really doing is tending towards the truth. We're just, we're, we're just counting uh, different people's values. And that's not going to possess the kind of conversion properties that we want uh, for epistemic democracy to obtain. So uh, in this paper, I want to offer two ways of conceptualizing a response to those skeptics. Um, and it builds off uh, work that I've done with a colleague, Adam Sales, a statistician at the University of Texas, where we uh, cash out this problem of whether epistemic democracy can be empirically validated using uh, data from the American National Election Survey, where we demonstrate that people possess beliefs about economic progress and vote in, in accord with those beliefs that they have and select the president um, on those grounds. So just some notation that I'm going to introduce. It's going to be very, very low level of notation. So let little a represent either 0 or 1. And that's going to be the, the, uh, the state of the world. So you can imagine little a is uh, whether the economy has grown or not. Uh, and big A sub I is going to be what I believes or what I chooses in the vote. So little A is going to be the fact of the matter, and big A is going to be I's belief on the matter. And so what we're going to be interested in, or I, and I want to think most epistemic Democrats are interested in, is that big A equals one conditional on little a equals one. That is, people's beliefs and, and choices about the world are informed by the facts of the matter about the world. And we can move to think about this even probabilistically. So it's not necessarily de uh, deterministic that people know how the people's beliefs correspond to their choices. But we just want to know that probabilistically, they're more inclined to believe the fact of the matter, to believe the fact of the matter, given given that it's in fact the case. So the way of representing this for epistemic democrats, I imagine, is to say that the probability that uh, that big A sub I equals one, conditional on little a equals one, is greater than the probability that uh, big A equals 1, given that uh, little a equals 0. Uh, that is, people's beliefs about the world, given the state of the world, is going to be greater than the probability of, their, uh, of those same beliefs, given that the, world, that the state of the world is alternatively presented. And so we can just as easily configure the problem to say that the probability of someone's choice or vote uh, corresponding to zero, given the fact that little a equals zero, 
um, is greater than the probability that their vote doesn't correspond to that matter. It's an error in the slide, I apologize. Um, this should be zero and this should be one. Um, so the problem, so the way that uh, I can conceptualize getting over the problem of value distinctions is that we might say, look, people might have different values about whether they think the economy should grow or not. It might be the case, I think most of us believe that when the economy is growing, we should reward the incumbent party. That's what the empirical literature suggests. But I don't want to rule out that there are individuals in the population that want the economy to shrink, that think that capitalism is bad, that the growth of the market economy only instantiates a hegemonic order, and they want the global, they want the global capitalist order to collapse in order for a more equitable or fair distribution of resources to obtain. And so all we need to say um, as epistemic Democrats, I argue, is that the fact of the matter, that, that people's choices correspond, uh, people's choices, people's beliefs, people's values correspond to the fact of the matter. So that um, a, wo uh, a woman chooses the, the party, rewards a party for economic growth, con uh, conditional on economic growth actually obtaining, um, or a woman punishes the party for economic growth, conditioning on um, economic growth obtaining. So all we want to do is have, is, is have a correspondence there. Uh, but it's not necessarily, it's not necessary that we choose either one or, we, that, we, that we need to have commitments about whether one or the other is right. So the way that we conceptualize this is uh, in a multi-dimensional space is where one's decision is the product of a whole bunch of considerations. So imagine that one's vote for president, I'm sorry I'm being Americocentric about this, um, is a function of what one's uh, preferences or values on abortion are, um, and also on economic progress. So each elector is going to have some probability of being successful, that is, knowing whether the candidate is going to instantiate her interests or um, produce her values uh, with regard to an issue, as well as some weight of, on how much she regards uh, that component of her decision function. And so uh, in uh, this paper with my colleague Adam, we say, look, we can uh, disagree about uh, any number of components. You and I can disagree about a woman's right to choose. But insofar as we agree on the value of economic growth and we have the capacity to assess whether the economy is growing, the candidate that is going to be a better steward of, of economic growth is going to have her chances of being elected boosted. So this is a little bit of a bug and a feature. It indicates that the epistemic property of democratic decisions frequently isn't going to be decisive. In most political decisions that we have, there are we have multi-dimensional interests. And the, uh, the number of values that we hold in common might be few. And so it's not going to be the case that our epistemic capacity is going to necessarily produce the right outcome. However, um, it's, going to tend the it's going to tend the election to go in the right direction. Right? And I think against the skeptical position, we argue, well, you certainly want it, wouldn't want it the other way around. That would be terrible that conditional on it being the case that candidate A is better in the relevant dimension, that her probability of being elected becomes lower. That produces unwa unwanted outcomes, and it would be a terrible result for epistemic democracy and, democ and democratic theory in general. So we say no. It just matters what the virtue of epistemic democracy in this case is that on the relevant dimension, the candidate has her chances of, elected, of, of election being enhanced, conditional on her, in fact, being more apt to, ins to instantiate these values or obtain the outcomes that the elector so chooses. 
And so the matrix looks something like this. Uh, there are accurate preference, there are accurate correspondences between one's vote or choice and the, the state of the world. And there are inaccurate uh, correspondences. And uh, there are cases in which the voter deems A to be superior to not A. And there are cases in which the voter deems not A to be superior in A. And so I think that we can bracket a lot of skepticism on the, the fact value distinction in epistemic democracy by just asking whether the voter is apt to get things right from where she stands. And we can be agnostic uh, on whether the values that she holds is, are right or wrong. Um, and nicely, this works for the majoritarian case, um, for the, like for the majority group or the minority group. If a majority of the electors prefer that the, that the economy grows and that the candidate that's a better steward of economic growth get elected, then her chances, that the candidate's chances of being elected are enhanced. Uh, but the minority will also be able to have a pull on the election in their desired direction. So while the aggregate push, well, it, it depends actually on the weights of the decision functions. Um, but in aggregate, it might be the case that the majority carries the day, and the majority is more has a greater sway on the election's outcome in the relevant dimension. The minority still has, with their disparate beliefs, conditional on them being minimally competent electors, still has the capacity to sway the election's outcome, which is, I think, nice for uh, a nice kind of bone to throw to proceduralists on the matter. So that's the, the first uh, kind of notation and result that I want to argue for that I think can allay worries about the fact value distinction. That all we need to say is that <coughs> the probability of accuracy of any voter conditional on their votes is greater than the probability of there being inac uh, inaccuracy. And we don't need to get into this, a fracas about which one is actually right, which I think is going to be hard to disentangle. The second part of my paper um, is relatively uh, straightforward, but I think it just produces some really nice results that I haven't seen before. If they've been presented elsewhere, please just let me know. Um, but I think these are really uh, elegant recommendations for the epistemic property of democracy. So let's imagine that um, voters have access to the truth um, around some distribution with a loss function. So the y-axis here is going to uh, mark how wrong they are, or uh, if you want to run utilitarian about it, the disutility. Um, and they're going to be drawing from a distribution with some mean and some variance. And the, the driver for the results of that, uh, epistemic demo uh, democracy in the case of the law of large numbers, uh, sorry, in the case of Condorcet jury theorem or the miracle of aggregation um, is the law of large numbers. That as the number of uh, decisions that come from an underlying distribution are aggregated, as n gets large, uh, the distribution converges on the, mean, the true mean with probability one. A, the, the flip side of the very same argument is that as, uh, as n increases, the variance decreases as a function of sigma squared over n. So as n gets large, the variance tends to zero. And I think that has some really nice, elegant, and st very straightforward epistemic properties as well. So we can imagine that initially the distribution looks something like this, where the elector is apt uh, to, uh, to converge on the mean, that is that they're unbiased, uh, but there's some variance there. All we need to do is say that the variance shrinks as the number of electors becomes large. And now the risk that the elector is off, the, the electorate is off, is reduced.
Moreover, we can have a, a quadratic loss function where now being further away from the truth is worse than being closer to the truth is. So uh, being, a little bit, being a little bit closer to your ideal point or to the optimum is good, but being farther away is really bad or comparably worse. And in this case, because the variance shrinks, um, they, the expected wrongness is also going to decrease. And I, I, so I think this has particularly nice uh, properties if we worry about the robustness of the system. So imagine that there's some threshold up here, um, some critical value, at which below which the system ceases to persist. That is, without, uh, Beyond, if you get values beyond this, everything just collapses and you're not able to rebuild. Um, or um, organisms work like this fairly, uh, fairly frequently, where if you have uh, too much diversity, it can lead to the collapse of the system. And that's kind of what cancer is. It's a mutation, it's more diversity, um, but it is an event in the tails that can metastasize and destroy the persistence of the organism. And so we might worry as, as Democrats that our, that our outcomes are going to tend, to, that with some probability are going to tend to the tails. And here again, as the number of electors increases, the variance is going to decrease, and the, and the probability of getting an event or getting a decision that's going to lie in the extrema is going to decrease as well. So lastly, I think that this even works in the case of value diversity. So if you have two different groups that disagree about some, where, where the truth lies, where their values are, there's going to be some variance to that. <coughs> As the number of electors in each group increases, the variance is going to decrease. And again, assuming a quadratic lo loss function to the state of the world, uh, it's going to be the, being the pro probability or the possibility of being farther away from the ideal point is going, the, the loss from that is going to outweigh the probability of the variance being on the other side closer. So I can illustrate that this way, where the distance between this little top bar is how much um, the orange man gains um, by or loses by the variance shrinking. But this bottom bar here is how much the, the orange man loses, probably. And the fact that this little bar, this bottom bar is larger than this top bar represents the, the loss that the orange man would, uh, the orange man would incur because of uh, the higher variance against the lower variance. So I, I think this is a, a, just a very straightforward and elegant way of presenting uh, considerations about robustness of epistemic democracy and our, our commitment to having uh, systems that can operate under perturbations. We can worry that we have outcomes that are in the tails and could threaten the, the persistence of political projects. And the response I believe epistemic Democrats can give is, would it be better to reduce the size of the, the electorate, of the franchise, or to increase it? And conditional, again, on minimally competent voters, having N plus one voters is always going to enhance the stability of the project against ha only having end voters. Uh, so to recap, I've provided two explanations for how I think we can get around the fact value distinction um, it, as epistemic democrats. One is by avoiding it altogether and just saying that what we care about is a correspondence between, val between values, beliefs, choices on the one hand, and the actual state of the world. And secondly, I've said that this nice property about the, the, the 
cond condensation of the variance as n grows large indicates that if we're loss averse in some way or risk averse in some way, having a larger electorate will create robustness against that. And in particular, in the way that epistemic that uh, epistocrats might say, oh, well, we should have knowers. Knowers are going to come with much larger variance on their estimates than a, biased, a possibly biased sample of Democrats who are going to have a much lower variance. That's all I got. Thank you very much. So now we'll have a discussion by Brianna McGuinness, which, which is a postdoctoral fellow uh, within the Department of Political Science at McGill. All right, thank you. Um, so first, thank you for presenting this very interesting, more formal theory-oriented paper. Thank you for the illustration. Um, so formal theory is outside of my area of expertise. So for the most part, my comments are going to focus primarily on the framing of the paper and on the implications of your analysis. Um, I'll keep my comments brief. So I have a few broader points, and then I'll get to some more specific ones. Um, so first on framing, the paper is fairly short. It's only about 12 pages. Um, but the first two are devoted to a narrative about the disastrous consequences of authoritarian rule. Um, and you contrast authoritarian rule with democratic politics, arguing that the latter are, if not guaranteed to get everything right, at least are more likely to avoid catastrophic results. Um, and although this narrative thread does occasionally reappear, um, it's not really consistently part of the story. So I just wonder exactly what you're doing with it, or if that's really what you actually want to be doing with the paper. Um, so, also because invoking extreme examples like the Great Leap Forward, Nazi Germany, and chattel slavery might distract more from your central, central arguments, which are fairly moderate, um, than advance them, than advance it. Um, so second, um, I would have liked to see the central argument a little bit better defined, but to see a clear statement early on, early on of exactly what you're going or trying to do with the paper, um, I think that was much more clear from your presentation, um, actually. So you say at, on page two in this paper, I lay out two broad ways um, to account for the epistemic successes of democracy, circumventing objections on grounds of value pluralism, ultimately providing reasons to support the quote unquote give it time approach. Um, and I think the paper does a, a good job of establishing why we have to support a give it time approach. Um, the attempt to, get to, circumvent, or sorry, to circumvent objections on the grounds of value pluralism, I think those are a little bit um, less consistently argued. Um, they, would, or they would at least benefit from being more fully developed, and I realize it's a draft and it's still in, um, in development. Um, so in the various parts of section two, you canvass some of the problems that value pluralism presents to epistemic democracy, um, but I don't know that you, you ever quite get around some of the most intractable problems, um, i.e. that not all issues have obvious rights or even like, quote unquote better or worse outcomes. Um, and I know you argue that we can bracket these things, and you give us reasons why we should bracket these things. Um, but I'm not, I, I, I think that's not quite what um, is sort of like promised by the introduction and maybe in the title. Right? That's not what maybe the reader expects um, from the introduction of the, the title. And I think it would, you could make a stronger case for why those issues are not actually important. So maybe make it a bit more explicit in the paper, um, especially because you use value laden language like right and superior. Um, so I think it's important to make a, a really strong case for why it's okay to set those things um, aside. Um, and currently, there seems to be a latent argument in the paper that epistemic approaches to democracy are suited to making certain types of decisions, right? So things that have obvious truth-tracking um, qualities, uh, but, but that these approaches to democracy are not suited to considering issues rooted in conflicting values. Um, and again, like, I'm not sure if that's something you, you wanted to, to imply. It doesn't seem to track. Um, again, like quite what is suggested in the intro. Um, so those are the, the sort of like bigger thing or the, the bigger points. And I think those could be um, addressed by drawing clearer connections between the various parts of the paper. Um, so again, like it's a, it's a draft. Um, and currently, the various sections make good arguments. Um, but I think it'd be helpful to see more clearly how each one of those steps leads to the next step, and then ultimately leads to your conclusions, because there are points in there where I think it's, like, even if it, you know, you're following the arguments that you're making about probability, um, et cetera, it's not, it's not so easy always to follow how those things lead to the next thing. Um, so a few smaller points. Um, first, I'd like to also hear a little bit more about your account of the truth, right? Um, I know that's a big, big question. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, truth-discovering aspects of epistemic democracy are, are supposed to be among its greatest virtues, and what are you actually um, 
saying as the truth. We have a footnote about this, but it'd be nice to see like a little bit, of, a little bit more about that because it seems like you're actually putting forth a pretty, um, like a pretty constrained version of that. Um, and again, so sorry, the, the question that keeps coming up, but how are you defining democracy, right? These are, I assume, decision procedures that you're talking about, right? Like voting, um, it would just be nice to see that sort of framed from the beginning. Um, just, again, like to follow how all these things are connected together. Um, and then finally, this is a small point, but um, footnote one uh, is currently, I think, something, something of a distraction. It's on page two, um, and it reads, so you're talking about what are authoritarian regimes versus what are democratic regimes. I mean, I think so, so for those of us who are maybe like a little bit less inclined about everything generally, um, but also democracy, um, there there does appear to be something of a danger of defining things that are good and just as being democratic, whereas things that are not good and not just are then redefined as authoritarianism without necessarily seeing like, well, why? Like, why are some of these bad things not democratic? Um, and you address this somewhat in footnote one, um, where you talk about the United States, and it says, and I quote. For what it's worth, the ethnic cleansing of Native Americans by the United States um, was committed against non-citizens and without markedly democratic procedures. While that doesn't absolve the U.S. of guilt, it does indemnify democracy to some degree. Um, I don't know, I think you might want to like, revisit how you phrase that, because uh, it wouldn't necessarily be better if it were done with democratic procedures. Obviously, that would be worse, I mean, worse for democracy. Um, but the non-citizens distinction also sort of stands out. Right? Like, um, what, like, what's the, the ethical work being done, right? Like, is it, is it okay if it's your own citizens, or if it's not your, oh. your own citizens? But I just think, like, so you might want to, like, rephrase, or, like, just revisit the, the phrasing of that, but no one. So, again, small, small points, um, but, but might, might distract readers like me. Uh, so that's, those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you read my, my paper incredibly carefully possibly more carefully than I, I had uh, anticipated. But no, 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 you, but everything you said is correct. Uh, and, and I acknowledge it, and I thank you because I will go back uh, work with and, and revise in light of your comments. Thank you. Um, with respect to comment number, footnote number one, um, my footnotes are generally where I store um, thoughts that occur to me in my head that are snarky or clever and are things that first go in the paper and then go into footnotes and then die. Um, <laughs> because they're claims that I don't want to make and I don't need to make. Um, there are things I might want to like discuss over a beer, possibly, but they are not things that belong in scholarly literature. So I apologize for that confusion. Um, in terms of uh, making the paper more coherent and drawing clearer uh, uh, connections between the various sections and particularly the way that the framing of the paper and the substantive sections I think is totally right and something that I very much want to do. This is uh, a, a rougher draft um, and but I, I yeah I, so I totally take your point there. Um, on the questions of the truth and I, I'm sure people will, will weigh on it, weigh in on this, um, I my my route is generally to be to avoid uh, conflict, if at all possible. So um, there are arguments that I think might be made about what I believe to be the truth, and I, I did provide a footnote to, as a gesture to that. But I worry that if that were I to take a stronger position on that, um, it would bog me down in an argument that um, I might not be able to win, um, or I might not be competent enough to make well. All I want to say is that, um, like. That there's this minimal condition that democracy can satisfy, and that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. That the, that all we need to say is that the, is that the truth um, corresponds to what people to to uh, that people's beliefs rather correspond to the the state of the world, and that is a kind of truth. It might not be truth fully explored or explained, but it's sufficient to be able to motivate to to keep the dem the epistemic democratic project up and running. Um, and I think it can, um, can answer a bunch of, of skepticisms. Like, look, we don't need to run thick about the truth. Uh, you know, yeah, we can, we can run with a, with a thick ontology if we want, but we don't need to. Uh, this, uh, this more um, bare bones conception is sufficient to, uh, to get us where we want. Um, and, and that's going to be uh, really helpful. So I just, so I, I'm, I'm open um, to, uh, to persuasion on this, on this point. Um, but I just don't want to don't want to make an argument that I can't substantiate, and I worry that 
trying to take on how I conceptualize the truth uh, might, uh, might bog me down in ways that uh, I wouldn't be the one that's fit um, to get unbogged from. Um, all right, that's all I got on the comments. But yeah, again, thank you very much. I think they're all like super helpful if you'd send them to me afterwards. I really appreciate it. All right, we're going to start the Q&A with Rich's question. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, so it's, it's a <coughs> clarificatory question in light of the um, discussion in the first part of the paper and the claim that this is about the fact value distinction. Mm -hmm. So just to clarify, normally the epistemic value of democracy um, obtains in just the same way when a majority of people have evil beliefs about justice and correctly identify that the evil party will bring about those values as to when a group of people um, believe that, let's just say, the just have just beliefs and correctly believe that the just party will instantiate those values. There's no difference in epistemic values in the two cases. So um, I'm agnostic on that point. Um, I can I say all I need to say is we don't that the epistemic value of democracy. Oh wait, so okay, so I hear what you're saying there. So you're saying, well, let's say the let's say in fact the candidate has her probability of victory enhanced um, by being pernicious and evil. If you if I don't, I don't think so. No, sorry, go on now. Maybe I'm. No, oh, so so let's say that uh, little a uh, is the fact that a candidate will uh, commit genocide. And big A is that I, I endorse right. the candidate that will commit genocide. Well, now epistemic democracy seem, would, on my telling, seem to indicate that, um, look, the virtue of epistemic democracy is that people can elect the candidate that's going to commit genocide. But that doesn't seem truth-tracking at all if we think that committing genocide is against the truth. Right? Um, it just seems that on, on your picture, the epistemic value is the same in both cases. Yeah. Which right, right, right. Not really have to satisfy someone like that. Oh, yeah, no, 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 no. no. So it's just, uh, and then it just seems like the epistemic value is so minimal that we might not think it really matters at all. When you, so, so I think that um, it allows, the framework allows us to remain agnostic on the point um, and say, here's a, here's a plausible way where uh, under conditions of value diversity, um, there, we can still think that um, epistemic democracy that epistemic democracy is good at get it, getting it right. And you might so importantly, you might believe that one state of the world is the right state of the world, and you might believe that voters have access to that to that state of the world. Um, and that when you are defining the conception of epistemic democracy, you see voters, and when you when you define voters as as being minimally competent. Part of that minimal competence is having uh, the right the right beliefs or the right values on these sorts of things. Um, and but all I'm saying is that we can. It might be the case we don't even know what those are, but we can still find evidence for the truth track the the truth tracking nature of of democracy. We can still find evidence for how it could be the case that epistemic democracy could uh, the values of epistemic democracy could pertain to a multi-dimensional vote like that, those for US president. Thanks. Kevin? Great, uh, so I'm just gonna follow sort of right on on this. So it sounds like what you're talking about is responsiveness and has nothing to do with, with the truth of the matter. So insofar as what, we're, what you're sort of uh, drawing attention to is uh, the reduction of variance uh, with the larger mm -hmm. number of people, the more likely that we're gonna get whatever sort of people want. Um, what you're talking about is, is responsiveness, and responsiveness really it does have this feature. Yeah. It's completely, as you say, agnostic yeah. about yeah. what the truth is, um, and that seems it seems like a very puzzling response to an objection. You you present the paper as as responding to Muirhead and Stitch's mm -hmm. complaint that democracy, that epistemic democracy, is does not obtain because of disagreement, um, and you seem to think that you're providing a response to them. But I don't really see this as much of a response to that concern, at least. Because um, what you seem to be saying is, well, regardless of what the truth is, um, democracy can get us responsiveness under certain kinds of fairly strong assumptions. Um, that doesn't seem, you know, if, if we think that the people are going to make the wrong decision, what you're telling me is that democracy will reliably get it wrong, right? Just the, you know, if the, if the conversation jury thing is less than 0.5, we're always getting it wrong. 
you know, decision. Well, right? no, no, that, so that's not the case either. It's mm -hmm. not, right, we're not always going to get the wrong, an we're not always going to get the wrong answer because it uh, depends what weights um, individuals are putting on the various dimensions. And so it could be the case that the minority puts a greater weight on, uh, on those elements of their decision function. And in fact, the minority is going to carry the day, or is going to, is going to provide the, the bulk of the effect along that dimension. Um, but but so I, I take your point um, that what I'm exp expressing here is this uh, the, the correspondence between uh, people's values or preferences and what they're able to choose. Um, so it, I think that it is a, a an argument for the plausibility of epistemic democracy. It's a way of seeing how we might be able to, to test or observe um, at the results of epistemic democracy actually working in our world. Um, but on the point of the variance, I don't see your objection about the responsiveness, because there, um, part of the property is that we're getting a consistent estimator. So, it, so there, I don't need to be agnostic about, uh, so. I guess so my, my point about responsiveness yeah. is that you seem to be saying that democracy can deliver what people want. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That is to say that by reducing the variance, it more reliably gets what we want. That, yeah, that people have the, act, the ability to obtain the outcomes that they so desire. Yes, yes that's response. Okay. All right. So, but why is that? So, why is that? Responsiveness is, is just entirely. It's just neutral, not. Yeah. yeah, it's just orthogonal to the truth of the matter. It's just orthogonal to whether we get the right answer. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a formal thing about the outcome of the decision procedure. But no, because if. Um, we're, so the, uh, the contrary way of framing it is to say that people don't have access to what they want. So it, 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 it doesn't pertain to the, it doesn't pertain to the responsiveness of the representative to the voter. It, uh, it pertains to the voter's belief, um, choices against, uh, and values against the, the fact of the matter. Um, and that's not that's not a matter of the responsiveness of the representative to her constituents. Um, that's just a matter of the voter being able to identify whether the pol the policy in question or the candidate in question, in, in fact, uh, reflects her values. So we could say something like, uh, in a ballot measure, we could think that there's uh, there are there's a liter there are two literacy programs. Um, and we want to know which literacy program, in fact, will enhance um, the literacy of the population. Right? We don't need to go to a representative system in order to cash out the, um, the, the usefulness of this notation. So people being able, so it might be we disagree on what the value of literacy is. But insofar as we agree on the value of literacy, we're able to choose the, the program that's going to be or that the program that's going to better enhance literacy is going to have the probability of its selection enhanced. That doesn't, so, so I might be misunderstanding, but that doesn't sound like responsiveness to me. I want to live up to that. So uh, both Gloria and Arash seems to have to s something to say on this. So Gloria and I'm then Arash. I am sensitive to the responsiveness uh, uh, objection. And uh, well, you see this, uh, mm, let's make an example, because I'm a simple minded mm -hmm. person. Yeah, no, I Take Turkey. Uh, uh, and uh, and <coughs> people in Turkey they uh, they were responsive uh, <laughs> uh, responsive to the fact that the economy really was growing uh, with uh, uh, Erdogan mm -hmm. and they voted Erdogan anyway they supported Erdogan for this and they uh, found uh, and in the end they ended up with a demo uh, shrink the, the democracy how do you deal with this kind of a, uh, situation I mean they the fact they were their vote were I think it was responsiveness, and if it is responsiveness, uh, you can say many things. But if if I go with mm -hmm. you and say they were, uh, their vote were, was truth tracking because actually th the economy really went better uh, under Erdogan. <coughs> then, in the end, uh, what they ended up with uh, is a, a really a bad, uh, a, sh a shrinking of their democratic. Uh, uh, 
life. I mean, so in a sense, it's a, it's a counterexample. Right. So in that case, I don't think that we need to so say they, yeah. that um, the the virtues of epistemic democracy are going to always allow us uh, to get um, to converge on the right answer. Right. The uh, the conditions of things like the uh, miracle of aggregation or the Condorcet jury theorem. Uh, require that voters meet certain conditions. And on any number of dimensions, it might just be, in fact, the case that voters aren't minimally competent or aren't independent. But in, this case, in the case of Turkey, they yeah. were competent. They were able to, to uh, track the truth that uh, Erdogan was uh, improving the, uh, the economy. This is true. I mean, the, the economy went so much better through uh, at the beginning of his uh, uh, mandate. Uh, and so they were true, they, their vote was uh, truth tracking in a sense. On the other hand, they ended up uh, with a, a big restriction of their democratic life. Right, so, so I can, what I want to say here is um, there are any number of other dimensions where they might, where voters might not have been competent to track the truth. It might be, have been the case that on any number, number of other dimensions, that regard things like democratic openness um, or um, uh, freedom of expression, the voters didn't weren't able to satisfy the conditions of epistemic democracy. Voters can get things wrong. It's not necessary that all voters have a, a have a competency greater than 0.5, or even an aggregate have a have a, comp a competence greater than 0.5. All I'm saying is that conditional on the meeting that uh, the right answer has a, a has it a the right answer in that just narrow tranche has its probability of getting elected enhanced and so on any number of other dimensions it was a shitty decision um, but along this one dimension where voters were tracking the economy they had the capacity to uh, to select the the candidate that was better on economic issues um, and conditional on and and if in fact you think that being better on the economy <coughs> The right is the right kind of competence to hold um, to be the um, the executive of a country. Then, at least on this narrow dimension, they were right. They were able to get the answer right. What's wrong with that? But the, the, well, I don't want to. But yeah. Um, okay. The, the, okay. So, so the, 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 the overall result was. So you. Bad, you know? I hear. I hear. So so we'll move on to Arash's point on this, and then we'll take David's question. Rather confused by what your claim is, and I think it has to do with uh, what both Richard um, and uh, and and Kevin were, were saying. Um, so I think the source of the problem, for me at least, is that um, I'm not exactly clear on what big A is supposed to be. Sometimes you mm -hmm. characterize it as a belief, mm -hmm. and sometimes you characterize it as a choice, um, and. I think you characterize it as something else either. And, and when I think about the structure of how the argument is supposed to go, that makes a big difference. So can you exactly give us, can you give us an example of, this is why it does seem to me that it's something like responsiveness, and I didn't quite understand what your response to that was, but can you give us an example that is not an example of A being a belief, uh, where, or with a big A, and the little a is some state of affairs? Yeah. Like, is that what it's supposed to like? I don't, I don't understand what, uh, give, can you give us an example so of where it's not a belief? It's, it's like, I guess you say your preference. Is that what, is that what Big A is supposed to be? Like, what's the... Big A is your access, or is, is the, 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 the outcome of that, that of your belief about the state of the world. So in the case of so let's the literacy say program, is equal to one. Yeah, what does that mean? That means that um, that means that you vote for okay. uh, you vote for literacy okay. program A. Okay, so big A is a vote. Yeah, it's not a belief. It says your belief, choice, or vote. Okay, right? but let's take it as a vote. Okay, so let's go with an example of a vote. So now, what is little A? <laughs> little A is is which proposal A or B? will enhance literacy. So let's say in, in, in the fact of the matter, liter literacy proposal A will lead to a literacy rate 
um, of 87%, and proposal B will lead to a literacy rate of, eight, of 95%. So in that case, uh, literacy, the literacy program B is the one that does a better job of enhancing literacy. So that, so. Oh, sorry, what are A and B supposed to be one and two? Or one and zero? Is that what? Because you have a. Uh, so, so they're, they're, sorry. The two, to, the two options of little a are either one or zero. Right. So can you tell me what one is? So one is the, one, let's say one corresponds to the literacy program that will, that will greater enhance liter communal literacy. And zero corresponds to the literacy program that will less will do a less good job of enhancing literacy. Uh, sorry, that can't be right. It's not, they're not referring to two different literacy programs, are they? Yeah. That's the way you just put it. Yeah. He's assuming like a direct democracy. Oh, so compositions. Yeah. Literacy yeah. program yeah. L okay. enhances and literacy yeah. program L doesn't enhance. Okay, yeah. Okay. So, All right, so okay. So um, that one that literacy pro so literacy program A um, produce it one literacy program enhances literacy and the uh, and or sorry let me step back uh, one literacy program uh, will actually re uh, this this liter the proposed literacy program would reduce uh, the amount of literacy in in the population and so a if you were to vote for it. It would actually. Could you, could you just, sorry, I just want to know what one is. One is, one is that the program affects the uh, affects the the positive outcome, the outcome, the economy growing, the the literacy the literacy enhancing, okay, so and okay. zero corresponds to the economy shrinking or the, the uh, a literacy program that reduces the amount of literacy. So conditional on one, which is conditional on the program proposed by the candidate, mm -hmm. increasing literacy. If big A is equal to one, that means that I vote for it. Now we want to know the probability of me voting for the program conditional on the program yes. increasing literacy. That's what you're getting at. Yes. And so what is that? I, I don't... I guess the reason why it doesn't look like anything to do with <coughs> epistemic democracy is because all that you're showing is that it satisfies my preference. Like, what's the probability that I'm going to get, I'm going to vote in a way that I you know, prefer? What's what? the probability that my vote is going to promote, your own promote the uh, outcome that I want? Right. So, so, in the way that I want to run the argument um, that is, if we can show that that, that, that obtains, and we think that uh, the majority of voters are right in their in their beliefs, that is, they they have the they have the commitments towards uh, the right outcomes, then there is the capacity for uh, so in this example that means that I'm right that more literacy is better. Like right. It's a normative, my, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. my normative belief that literacy is good is correct. Yes. That's what that, so if we're, okay. I have data on this. Sorry. Yeah, good. So I share a lot of these same concerns, but let me see if I can sort of flesh out something more on the defensive side of what that is uh, in defense of what you're doing. I understand. So suppose all that this dimension you're talking about gives us is something like the tendency of people to get what they want mm -hmm. or to promote what they want through voting. Okay. Um, one little small point is you're not actually arguing that there is such a tendency. You're just saying that's a separable question. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I want to really note that because Condrey's so kind of jury thing is very controversial whether it's applicable or not. So we don't have an argument that even this feature obtains. You're just saying that would be something. Mm -hmm. People say I don't see what it would be. It's just people getting their arbitrarily evil or good ends. But in defense, I would say um, standard epistemic democracy would want that to be present. It's not the only way to get the ultimate epistemic value. It could be that you have this other weird thing that people have evil aims. They're very bad at pursuing them. That's not normally the way we want it or expect it to go. 
So you could say, look, this doesn't answer the other thing about what my brain about the people have good aims. But part of the story we're going to want is that people can at least promote their aims, and then we'll work like, you know, separately. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that, that, so, yeah, that's, that's, so that's, that's, that's a separable that. question. Right. We've got that minimal feature that all epistemic Democrats do count on. Yeah, yeah, that's, 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 that's what I, I hope this notation yeah. uh, might allow us to, to articulate and resolve it. Hey, so what are the little thing then, since that went very well? Um, <laughs> it was fairly quick. Um, yeah, it'd be good to step back and see what, what motivates your skepticism or your wantingness to, what, what, your desire to separate yourself from whether there's any validity to value claims. Like, why? Do, I mean, there's only <coughs> have value commitments. Do you think they're not correct? Do you think other people aren't? Missing? You know, there's a, I want you to sort of maybe think more about what, what strong reason should we have to think it's a virtue if you can step back from whether there's any right or wrong answers about what's going or bad. Why would you want to do that? And then whatever your answer is, if you do want to do that, well, then why would we care if people can promote their age? Do you want to say that's good? Or just expressing your emotions when you say that? Mm -hmm. Right? Because only you're recommending something as a part of a recommendable social scheme, but you can't do that same time you think there's just no such thing as recommendable. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so thank you very much yeah. for that. And I, yeah, you said, uh, you said what I was, I was hoping to say uh, more clearly, um, that, it's, it, that this feature, the separability of this feature, um, is something that that all epistemic de democrats would uh, would take for granted, and it's not going to be the the full blown project uh, that others are going to to be able to construct. Um, but it's at least a narrow tranche of of that uh, claim, um, giving us some tr like tractability on this problem. Um, I guess I want to be able to say that um, there are legitimate cases of value pluralism. Um, and you and I can. This is very. Right. Can I ask about what you mean by pluralism? It's notoriously ambiguous yeah. in literature. Sometimes it means a metaphysical view that there are there's no commensurability among values. Mm -hmm. And I think you mean something like value diversity, but okay. that's not any source of skepticism all by itself. People disagree about things sure. about you, but that's true. If you use the word pluralism, you might seem to be smuggling in something more metaphysically problematic about value, which I don't think you mean. Is that right? right? People disagree about things about value. Too, but that's true. Right. Right. Um, okay, so I'm, yeah, uh, I hear. I'm, I'm happy to, to resign to, uh, to diversity, uh, but then right, there are these weights that we can disagree on, and it seems to, be, to me to be reasonable uh, to just, for you and I to disagree, to, uh, to disagree on how much weight to put on environmental values versus how much weight to put on economic success. Um, and so it's going to be hard for me to say that uh, we came to the right answer, given that. That's a crucial step. Why? How do we get from it's reasonable to disagree about X that nobody can say there's a right answer about X? Both of the parties think there is. They can't disagree unless they think there's a right answer. But, you know, that's a little too. So, be, so I, I so, but right this might be a problem uh, for political aggregation that individual actors um, have some sense about what's good for them. But what's good for the whole? What they in their vote, they might not be uh, considering what is good for the whole. Uh, that is, so that so I can represent my interests in the environment, and that from where I stand, uh, uh, resistance to uh, uh, cl climate change regulation is very important, and I'm going to put a very high weight to it. Whereas you might think that the horse is already out of the barn, and there are that. There are human suffering issues to alleviate. Uh, that seems like a, a reasonable disagreement that we can have. And that even though uh, we value those things differently in, in our own decision functions when we come to vote, um, the aggregate, uh, that those things are going to, to mess up the aggregateness of the right or wrong of, of the outcome of the vote. I just don't get the last step. A okay. reasonable disagreement about whether the environment is still an important issue given where we are now, and both parties think there's a right answer to this. And you seem to think, I don't, you seem to be saying we shouldn't think there's a right answer to this, or we should treat it as if there's no right answer to this, and just to know what basis there is for stepping back from thinking, as the parties do, there's a right answer about this, even though it's, there's reasonable disagreement about it. All right. Yeah, so I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah, I have just one tiny friendly suggestion and, and then the question. The suggestion is just maybe you should make it clear that 
to your credences, the P's, mm -hmm. that, that there are no, you don't have credences over odds, for example, because many people want to model um, or ac access to objective values by, by way of odd beliefs. I believe environmental issues yeah. ought to be pursued or valuable and so on. So just to, to get this clear separation that you want between um, the descriptive stuff in the piece and the normative stuff in the W's. The, the other question that I'm very much interested in is um, why you think that people's beliefs are more responsive than 0 0.5 to truth, I should say responsive, right? The issue here about being accurate or, or responding to the truths out there. Um, usually, so I come from a background in, uh, right now in uh, about questions of rationality, and there are a lot of people who, who have argued that rationality is worthwhile because um, of evolutionary considerations, for example. So we, 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 our beliefs get at the truth because um, we're because of selection arguments that is external biology and so on. But these people also usually point out that these selection pre pressures are very domain specific. So your beliefs about a car approaching when you want to cross the street, that's that's something that had better be accurate and responsive and so on. Mm -hmm. But it's not so clear what selection pressures there are for our political beliefs or beliefs about complex Society yeah, issues to be to be right. Do you want to say something about why there would even there's reason even to think that there's a, a tiny um, amount better than 0 0.5 that, that we need to get this conversation to read? Um, well, so that sounds like a, a, a question of empirics to me, right? Whether it is in fact the case that on any of these dimensions uh, voters are uh, satisfied that. that conditions of minimal competence. Um, and so, right, um, were quantum mechanics to be germane to an election, it might very well be the case that people didn't have minimal competence. Um, but um, in what we explore, the economic literature, people do seem to have access to um, GDP growth um, or the uh, the, the rate of uh, uh, annual, annual change in uh, real disposable income. Um, and so when it is a fact where people can look around them, they can see how they and them, their friends are doing, whether people are making purchases, uh, are saving more, they, they have epistemic access to these facts. Um, and they seem to be able to do a better than um, average job of assessing whether the economy is growing or not. Um, and so when we look at a, so we, you can't assess whether any particular actor um, is better than random, because it might just be the case that she came up tails a bunch of times uh, when you look at a survey result. But when we look at sub, uh, take a subgroup analysis and look at um, a, a bevy of different subgroups within the electorate, no subgroup is uh, worse than average, than, than 0.5 at assessing whether the economy is growing or not. And that's, uh, that's heartening for um, epistemic Democrats, that people, in fact, on relevant dimensions that do seem to matter politically and people do care about, they do have access to the truth. Um, they do know whether the economy is growing or not. Even though evolutionarily there might not uh, be any obvious reason for why people have uh, strong access to economic growth. All right, so we're uh, pretty much out of time, so let's thank Sarah.